The third thing I'd like to talk about is diffraction. We've seen diffraction already in the, uh, as part of the core topics uh, under waves. We were looking at uh, an example of, well, maybe I'll just draw it actually. Um, we were looking at an example of some sort of wall here where we have some, some kind of slit. So this, this could be some sort of wall that has a little hole cut in it. Uh, that would be your little hole here. Now, what if we had light coming in? So we have light come in, comes in, and if it passes through this slit, um, we would totally expect it, if this is a solid wall right here, we would totally expect that the light from this uh, would actually do something. Now this, this is the different thing now that we're doing in the HL version here, or in this uh, option, is that we take diffraction a little bit further. Before we were just looking at light coming in like this, it didn't even have to be light. Um, it could be anything else, but we were looking at a path difference. And you know, the difference in path told you if it was going to be constructive or destructive interference. In this case, we're going to take a look at that in more detail. We're not going to care as much about the path difference, but we're going to care now about what, what pattern we might get on the end here. Now, if this was light, I would, uh, if I made this slit, uh, you know, fairly small, because remember, um, this slit needs to be small, um, or at least uh, smaller than the wavelength in order to have diffraction happening. So let's assume that, um, you know, I have light of a very big wavelength right now and it's coming in through this slit, or maybe I make my slit even smaller than, there we go. So now my light doesn't have to have such a big wavelength. So now I have my slit right here. This is the hole. This is the opening right here. If the light goes through, what a lot of people would expect is that I should get some sort of bright dot on a wall here. This is some sort of, let's say this is a wall or a piece of paper, a sheet, something like that. Uh, my students like to say, holy sheet, sorry. Um, but uh, what if we did this? We would totally expect, let's say this is a laser firing through this, we would totally expect to see some sort of bright spot in the middle. And we do see that, so great but we also see light do something called diffraction. Uh, by the way, this is actually related to if light is a particle or a wave. It turns out, well, light is light. But if we try to understand if it's a particle or is it a wave, or does a particle work to explain light, or does a wave work to explain light? This example right here tells you light cannot be a particle. Because if you imagine shooting things you know, through a little hole, you totally expect to get things here, no problem. But you don't just get this. If you do this experiment, you actually get um, a dimmer set of dots here, and an even dimmer set here, an even dimmer set over here. In other words, you see these sort of bright spot, and then you see little, uh, another spot, and another spot, and another spot. And each successive one that's further away from the center gets dimmer and dimmer looking. Now, when people first looked at this, they were like, what? What does this mean? What could this mean? Well, it means that light acts as a wave, or at least a wave is a good way to explain what light's doing here. Because light isn't necessarily a wave, it's not necessarily a particle. It turns out it's particle-like wave, we could say. Sounds cheap. But if we look at this then, with this geometry that I've got here, what I could do then is take a look at um, some angle. So I could take a look and define some sort of angle theta here. So I could take a look at, you know, how bright does this look on this screen depending on the angle that I've sort of subtended away from the center. So we could take this thing right here and rotate it and then do a graph of intensity. And that's what I'm going to show you now. Okay, so I take this thing right here and I'm going to rotate it and make it a graph of intensity versus angle. Now the intensity of the light could be measured in lots of different units. It could be in uh, watts per meter squared. It doesn't matter too much. The key thing here is just looking at, you know, how bright is the light. This is going to be my angle theta. And um, I want to define a few things here, actually. I'm going to define um, this, the slit width, actually, is going to be B. So that's going to be my slit width is going to be called B here. And then what I'm going to do is actually def uh, define my angle in what we call radians. So it's not going to be in degrees. It's another unit called radians. If you haven't seen those before, um, 
well, it's part of a math course, but uh, just to explain very, very quickly, if you think about going all the way around in a circle, that will be 360 degrees. It turns out in uh, math and in science, sometimes it's easier not to talk about degrees, but to break up a circle, instead of going around 360 degrees, we'd say you go around two pi radians. So which means if you, you know, define your angle like this, then you're just dividing uh, 360 degrees into two pi radians. And so that's sort of how we start to define it. You can convert from degrees to radians, radians to degrees. Just make sure that if you're working with um, your calculator um, and you're working with sines or cosines of angles in radians, you actually have to change your mode on your calculator. So that's important. But all that being said, uh, just imagine though, you know, bigger angle means further away. So if we look at this graph then, uh, maybe I'll draw it in green to represent this. A bright, bright spot right in the middle means a bright spot right in the middle and it's going to do this nice type of curve here like this right here like that so in other words it's going to fall off so it's bright right in the middle at zero or right, this point right here is at zero radians here that represents zero and then we can have plus and minus in angles right because we can have up or down um, but it doesn't just do this it also makes these other ones so we could actually draw them like this. Maybe it goes like this. Now the key thing when you draw these is make sure these actually have to touch the bottom. In other words, they really will be a minimum. Then it goes up. And after that, there's another one maybe, but it's a little bit lower. And so on. I mean, this actually goes on and keeps doing this. So it's got like these little wings on the sides here. Um, and you can actually make a nice math equation to um, model this. But we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to look at what angle do you get the first minimum. That's going to be the key thing here. Okay, so the first minimum happens at an angle, theta equals lambda over b. This is the key thing here. Now this... Uh, just this um, equation right here, this is in your data booklet, but they don't really tell you it's the first minimum. Wait, or do they? Let me just double check. Uh, nope. On your equation, uh, on your data booklet, they only tell you theta is lambda over b. Now you can think about, you could actually draw the geometry for it and it actually has a sine, but it turns out at small enough angles, sine theta is approximately equal to theta in radians. And so that's why you can do this approximation. Uh, only because it's a very, very small angle. So we can actually say this happens, which means, see this value right here? That's the first minimum. That's a spot where it goes from really bright light to no light, and then it's going to go bright light again, then no light again. Right? So in other words, uh, geometric representation of that will be right here. This would probably be my minimum. You know, at this angle, I've got all my light here is sort of dropped off. If that's the case, then this is at plus lambda over b. But of course, it also happens at minus lambda over b. So that's the first minimum. Can you guess where the second minimum happens? If you guess 2 lambda over b, then you're right. So that's just the first minimum. The next one happens at another lambda over b. So now we better define things. So theta is your angle in radians. Lambda is your wavelength of your light. In this case, it's going to be in meters. And B is going to be your slit width. That'll also be in meters. So the key thing going on here is that we have a slit. What, what I mean by that is we have some sort of opening and this is usually like a wall. Imagine like a big solid wall and a big solid wall and you just have like a little line cut into it. If light can go through that sort of straight up and down line, then you have this. Okay, so this right here is uh, something that we call diffraction. So we have that actually happening here in this case. And the key thing to remember is that for a slit, in other words, you know, some sort of just a slice through a material, if light passes through it, the first minimum happens at theta equals lambda over b. Don't forget theta is in radians. So that's the key to working with diffraction.